Well, welcome to our first BMC virtual foray. Uh, Chris Nepis and I are up here in the woods surrounding Tamworth, New Hampshire, and we're in a beautiful spot. We're in the middle of a four-day heat wave, but it's not too bad up here by the brook in New Hampshire. It's a lot of moisture because of all the water being dispersed in the air. The mushrooms are prevalent everywhere, and uh, we're hoping to find a lot of different species to show you. There's something over here that just caught my eye because the color is beautiful. It looks like a little lactifluus, used to be called uh, lactarius. And uh, yeah, that's what it is. And milk mushrooms, um, they tend to have uh, latex like sap that comes out when you cut them. This is um, hygrophoroides, you can't really see it from here, but it uh, has widely spaced gills kind of a velvety orange cap and an orange stem and uh, these things will put out a lot of a lot of fluid when you cut them under here you can see like the droplets of latex coming out just from handling it and and cut the stem you you can almost see it almost drip off of there it's just very very juicy this is one of three of the good edible orange lactarius or lactifluus it's um, hygrophoroides, but there's also one called volemus, whose gills are much closer together and tend to stain brown. And uh, then there's a third one, corgus. When we might find them all by the end of the walk, but it's a good time of year for milk mushrooms in the midsummer. And uh, they, are, they are good edibles and they have very crunchy texture. But I'm gonna throw this one in the basket. Hey Chris, here's something. What do you got? It's like a scaly-based chanterelle. Um, cough, cough, uh, what is it, Turbinella Kaufmannii? I believe. Here's a young one right here. And you can see how it kind of gets these strange, like, teeth coming in the middle of the, the vase. It almost looks like it's reaching out to bite you. And it has these fold, fold-like gills all around the outside. This isn't one you want to be eating, although I think some people eat it, but it's, it's usually bitter and not really good for you. I think you can see why they called it a chanterelle, although it's not really related to the yep. chanterelles at all. Uh, mostly because the, it's not really uh, gills on the outside, it's more yeah, it's ridges cold. and so forth. Here's some, uh, here's some wax caps over here, a whole little flush of them. And uh, the wax caps, the smaller colorful wax caps generally are in the hygrosabi family. And the gills are kind of very waxy underneath and usually widely spaced. This one's probably Miniata, but I'm not sure. There's a lot of orange, orange red kind of hygrosabies out there. They tend to grow in, in wetter, mossy areas like this. And there's a lot of water drainage through here. Looks like the first chanterelle of the trail, which is what we're hoping for today. Oh, um, nice. But there's all kinds of stuff here. Here's a, here's a little uh, Coltricia cinnamonica, which uh, always seems to grow trail side. But this is a beautiful little chanterelle. You see how it has these folds under the, under the um, cap. They're not really gills, they're just folds. They won't separate from the cap if you press on them or try to pull them aside. Or Beautiful, fresh, young one. They get a lot bigger than this, but it's a nice little little specimen. And uh, chanterelles always grow individually. You might get a clump of a few together, but um, you're not gonna see them growing as a cluster and you're not gonna see them growing on wood. You know, those would be either jack-o'-lantern or false chanterelle. And they usually have this beautiful kind of egg yolk color. Most of the golden chanterelles are. Analensis, am I saying it right? Analensis. Analensis. It's a nice time of year for bolites, and here's a beautiful bolite. We can get the whole thing. The problem was, if you're collecting bolites for the table, this time of year they get very buggy very fast. This looks like. It used to be in the family Telopolis, now it's a uh, Sutarius Sigzimus uh, lilac purple brown bolete or something. It's, uh, the stem is kind of purple color, the cap is this lavender color. This is really, a, as with a lot of 
former tilapia mushrooms. It's hard, hard, hard. The cap is hard. The stem is really solid and hard. And I would guess in the summertime, yeah, in the summertime, worms hit boletes really quickly. You know, you cut into the stem and you'll find they're, they're just kind of chewed up by worm tunnels throughout. Um, this is not a bolete you'd be eating anyway, but you can see the worm tunnels all through it. They get in there fast, and this is still really hard and fresh. Um, but you can see in the context, what color, the context is the term we use for this uh, meat of the mushroom, the meat in the cap. And you can see the worm tunnels are all brown. Sometimes they change different colors. Um, and the pore layer is pretty, pretty wide on these. Um, this is a mushroom that you're not, usually not gonna eat anyway because the flavor is very bitter. It's not poisonous, but it's not very palatable. So people don't usually collect this one to eat. But it's a beautiful mushroom, a nice example of it. So speaking of boletes, here's some more boletes. This is a, you know, you gotta you got realize when we're out in the field like this, we're just doing on the spot ID and some of them are probably wrong or our best guesses, let's say. Um, this bolete, here's a baby one and a full grown one. And you can see there's a big difference in size here, but it's probably the same mushroom and it's probably Minio olivaceus, um, which tends to have a pinkish red cap as it's younger and gets more brownish in age but usually has these kind of olive brown discoloration patches on it one of the characteristics of this is anytime you handle it or touch it it blues extremely quickly and uh generally with boletes and full of insects at this age you can tell but um and you can see the tunnels here are red as opposed to the last one we just looked at that were brown um but it's mainly these pores that just bruise really quickly to a dark blue. With boletes, one of the basic rules when you're starting with boletes is if you're looking for things to collect for the table, generally things that bruise blue are not good prospects. Stuff that has red pores are not good ones to collect and things that are bitter to the taste. Um, it's okay to taste the mushroom. You shouldn't swallow the piece you taste, but you can nibble a little edge and just see how it, uh, how it hits your tongue and whether it has bitterness to it. So there's uh, some rustlers over here that are worth, worth taking a look at because when you're out in the woods and you're trying to identify things on the spot, rustlers are one of the hardest because there's millions of colors and they're not really well covered in the mushroom literature. But this is one that's fairly easy to identify and you can see it here in every stage from like fresh little buttons to rotting old things. Um, but it's called Russell Marii, and some of the characteristics of this is kind of a rosy pink flush on the stem and it has this kind of dusting powdery dusting on the surface um, that is very distinctive especially when they're young here's a good example this one's really young and you can just see you can see like the dusting of color on the cap and uh, and that pink stem and it's one of the few red rustlers that people do eat because red rustlers, there's hundreds of varieties and some of them will make you very sick. So if you're wrong on a rustle identification, um, you could be in trouble on a red one. So most people avoid the red rustlers. These two won't be coming home with us because they clearly have a lot of worms in the tunnel. This one is so young, it's actually fresh. I'm gonna throw it in the basket to take back with us. The other thing to keep in mind about rustlers is they're pretty easy to ID. Um, they tend to have a shorter stature. They don't grow too tall for the most part. And they can be big, but they're usually not that tall and thin. Um, and the stems are very brittle. They have a different cellular structure. So when you take a rustle and you, you bend the stem, it's brittle. It's just going to snap and break apart. When they're young and fresh, they're still brittle, you know, even at an early age. And um, they're, they're basically very closely related to lactifluous, but without the milk. Rustlers are one of the most common mushrooms. You can see them throughout the woods, all different colors. Some are edible, some aren't. Most people don't pick much rustlers for the, many rustlers for the table, but Mary Eye is a good one to take and get to know. Here's another one of these scaly vase chanterelles that we saw earlier. This one is a beautiful young one. It's got um, a nice orange color to the inside. I, the current name is Turbinella flacosis, I believe. And this one looks very different than the last ones we saw in that the interior is kind of smooth and orange where the other one had almost teeth coming out. And so it's a little bit different. 
Um, also, it's not really one you want to be eating, but it's a beautiful mushroom that you can find a lot of in the woods this time of year. Some good bolitos over here, Chris. And I don't want to get my hopes up, but it could be edgeless. Um, the porcini. And there's one hiding under there, which I would guarantee is probably worm eaten at this point, but there's a young one next to it. Yeah, it sure looks like it. Um, I don't know if you can get in close enough with the camera, but one of the characteristics of, let me pull this loose, of edgeless is the stem has white reticulation on it. It's very faint sometimes at the top, but it's like a netting pattern. Yeah. We'll, take, we'll take a look at the younger one and see if that one can be seen a little bit more clearly. This is a beautiful little mushroom. Yeah, you can see it a little better. You know, the reticulation in there, like a white netting. The pores are generally very tight like this and kind of a cream color. And it's probably, it's probably got some worms in there, but it's worth, it's worth taking this one back because it's in pretty good shape. It's a nice example. And, uh, they have this beautiful chestnut colored cap. Some are darker, some are lighter. There's a, it's a whole group of mushrooms and they're not all, not all identical and there's a little variation in what trees they associate with, but the whole Boletus edulis group is just a wonderful group of edible mushrooms that people really hunt for. So I was just saying to Chris as we were walking, I wish we could find a, um, a Gyroporus cyanescens because uh, it's a really cool, that's a good edible mushroom and has really neat color change. You can already see where I've touched it, but watch this. It, it's, it starts out like this kind of straw color, and when you cut it, it almost instantly changes to this sky blue. And it's really a beautiful, unique kind of color. And look at it, it's just really bright. Like most bluing mushrooms turn a dark, almost black blue. But this one gets this really pretty sky blue and you can see anywhere I've touched it, it's changed color. It's that sensitive. It's that sensitive. Even on the top of the cap, you touch it or make a little cut and it'll blue up. Um, really, it's a beautiful little mushroom. I found these that were almost, almost this color green. They vary a lot in color. Usually this is the color you see that's kind of this straw color. And uh, easy to miss in the woods because it blends in really well. And even though it, it takes the rule of bluing mushroom this is a good edible mushroom and that color is so distinctive you can't you can't miss that color change i want to put that one in the basket to bring home here's another interesting bolete that you run into a lot in the woods um and watch out for the little bit of poison ivy is that poison ivy next to it i don't know but this is heria chromapes the yellow foot bolete and you can see why they call it a yellow foot it's, uh, it's really distinctive, this bright yellow at the bottom of the stem. It has pinkish pores and a, um, a pronounced pinkish top. Um, it's edible. It's a decent, decent bolete to take home if you're looking for edible boletes. Um, and it's very easy to identify. However, you always have to look all over a mushroom when you're identifying one, because here's one we found earlier. Same thing, another, another hairy, a little, little different looking, um, but also has the yellow foot. But then we found another one next to it that looks exactly the same. You know, just we said, oh, there's three hair, you know, another one. And even is a little yellow at the base. But if you look underneath, the pore color is completely different. It's a yellow pore as opposed to this kind of creamy white pore. And so these are two completely different mushrooms, even though they're, they're side by side and look almost the same from the top. And this one, I'm not sure what it is. There's a lot of yellow pore, red capped boletes. We'd have to do a little more. Uh, research and take a look at the books to figure exactly which one out. There's a lot of similar boletes in this category. All right, we're down by the brook here and there's something really interesting. This is a, we found this little thing and we're thinking it's some kind of earth tongue or spindle, but then Chris dug up the other one and look at that. It's grown right out of a, some kind of an insect larvae. So this is some type of cordyceps that parasitizes insect pupa. And uh, it's growing right out of there. You can see it coming out of the insect. So that was a really interesting find. Another bolete we're gonna see a lot of in the woods this time of year is 
Swealus spragii used to be called Swealus pictus, also known as the painted Swealus. Swealus is a whole family of boletes that are generally the less appreciated boletes. The name, I think, means little pig. And uh, it's kind of a furry red cap and very beautiful stem. You can see that there's kind of a, a layer of a cortina layer that's kind of tiny fibers separating the pores from the top of the cap to protect it when it's young. These guys are actually a good edible, but I've n almost never found them where they were young enough where they weren't full of worms. And this is already all chewed up. But if you cut this open, you can see, here's the pore layer, this yellow part right here. And then this we have is this little webby cortina that's there on the young mushroom to protect it and keep it moist till the mushroom gets a little bigger. This is a mushroom that will change color, gradually gets kind of a blackening on it. You can see it's, it's changing slowly. But uh, a lot of people don't really like to eat this one because when you cook it, it turns really black in the frying pan and kind of looks a little slimy and disgusting, but it's actually not a bad tasting mushroom. Nice yellow context, but you can see the worm tunnels all turn red on this one. Okay, this, these things stopped us in our tracks because the color was so intense, we had to like stop and take a look. Um, it's a whole flush of little wax caps, the hygrosabes, and look at the color of these things. They're just brilliant, brilliant red-orange. And uh, really, some of the hygrosabes are some of the most beautiful mushrooms in the, uh, in the woods, but not every hygrosabe is, is bright. Like, here's one that's gray in color, but these are just beautiful little wax caps. I, the color here is just neon. It's like, it doesn't even look real. It's so bright, really spectacular. We're in, a, we're in a new spot now. We went to a different trail up here in New Hampshire. And uh, there's some beautiful Amanita rubescens here, which we haven't really talked about yet. This is one of the more common Amanitas. With Amanitas, it's always very important to get the base because the base of the Amanita is often important in identifying what it is. This is a fairly common one that you run into a lot. Um, you don't usually see them cespitos like this where two growing together, but it's rubescence. Could be flavor rubescence, you know? That's the more gold one, but I think it's just a regular rubescence. Rubescence refers to the fact that um, the stem, when it gets damaged, kind of takes on a pink color. And you often have pink tones in the base of it. And you can see the bulb, it gets swollen out at the base of it. It has a very large skirt-like ring. Skirt -like ring. Um, also has a lot of these patches on the top, which can be a little deceptive because, look at this, they come right off. So if you have a heavy rain, it'll have no patches at all. And the patches are remnants of the universal veil. When the mushroom is really young, it's got a, almost an egg around it of skin. And that membrane all breaks away and remnants of it stay on the cap like this and often around the base too sometimes, but not on this particular one. But you can see the pinkish tones in here. Um, Amanitas are generally a mushroom that nobody eats because there's some deadly poisonous mushrooms in the family. Rubescens is one of the few that some people do eat after parboiling, but I wouldn't recommend. Um, but it's a, it's a beautiful mushroom and they get very big in stature. Amanitas tend to be taller mushrooms. They tend to have longer stems and big caps. Um, there are some small ones, but rubescens is not one of them. Rubescens can get very large. Usually if, you, if you're thinking, oh, I'd like to find something, that's when you never find it. But I was just saying it because it'd be great if we could find some bicolor boletes because I love them. Um, the the co current name is Bayerangia bicolor. And uh, it's a beautiful mushroom. It has kind of a, when it's young, the cap is very velvety in texture. Um, it's, it's a mushroom that's kind of distinctive in a few ways. And I'll show you a couple of the ways. One is that it doesn't blue rapidly like a lot of the other red and yellow mushrooms. Um, this one, it will, it will blue sometimes, but really not much. You know, you might get a little bit of bluing on the stem, especially at the base. But one of the real characteristics of this mushroom is it has really narrow, narrow pore layer. When the mushroom is young, you almost can't see the pore layer. It's so slim. And, uh, that's, that's kind of a distinctive feature. 
this one I'm guessing is full of worms, yeah, because um, it is an older one, but it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful bolete that's in our woods a lot. The color varies, sometimes you'll find them almost golden, but when they're young, the most commonly seen color is this kind of like velvety red texture, and they're very dry, they're never sticky. The pores are very tight together and bright, bright yellow. So it's a beautiful mushroom, and sometimes there can be just thousands of them in the woods. This year there haven't been a lot, but every year is different. So we found some interesting boletes here, and you know, one characteristic of boletes is it has the tiny pores, sponge-like layer under the cap. And uh, so this one, when we turned it over, turns out it has gills. And it's one of the few boletes that has gills, and it's a, a Philoporus rhodoxanthus. And this is a good edible bolete. This one's, this one's buggy, but um, it's a soft kind of velvety pinkish cap, bright yellow pores that are slightly decurrent, which is what we call it when the, the, the gills come down the stem a little bit. And part of how a bolete is identified is the pore layer comes off very easily. So even though these are gills, it'll separate from the cap, although this one's a little bit too old. It's just squishing when I try to separate them. But um, you can see it this way as it separates out. And uh, it's really, it's a striking bolete. It's really pretty. It's very, it's a very good edible. Um, not in this condition, but um, nice one to find. Look what we found. This is, this is one of the treats you're going to find when you're up in the woods in New Hampshire that we usually don't see much of in Massachusetts. One of the most beautiful of all the Amanitas. There's some over here, there's some over here, they're all over the place. This is, used to be called the American Caesar um, because it's so similar to the, the prize Caesar mushroom from Europe. But this is a Amanita Jacksonii, is the American version. And it's, it's a beautiful mushroom, although Amanitas will kill you if you pick the wrong ones. These are one of the few edible Amanitas. They can even be eaten raw. But it comes out as an egg. And here's a beautiful egg over here. And that's just a perfect example of one coming right out of the, out of the duff with a perfect little egg. And so it starts out like this. This is how all the amines will start out encased in egg. And then they get a little bit bigger. Oh, it's breaking off, but you can see that the egg remains on the bottom and it'll kind of, the stem gets kind of brittle. But some characteristics of the Jacksonii are this beautiful reddish-orange cap, slight striations on the side of the stem. But the thing you want to make sure is that the gills themselves, let me find an older one right here. The gills are yellow, and it has kind of a skirt-like ring, and it also has almost a herringbone pattern on the stem of yellow and orange. Um, Flaviconi is one of our most common Amanitas, and the gills are white, so it's very easy to tell the two apart. Also, the Jacksonii can be gigantic. You know, these are these are not gigantic ones, but they're pretty pretty good size. Here's a nice kind of in between stage. Of, it's out of the egg, but it's still kind of young and not open yet. You know, and that's that's all the different stages. You have them right there, and even the older ones. Um, here's a yeah, here's a really old one, but kind of starts to lose color and curl upwards like that as it gets very old. But uh, these are just just beautiful amanitas, and there's there's another batch of them right over here, Chris. Look at over there; those are some beautiful ones. The color is just spectacular on these. That's, that's like a picture-perfect Amanita, just absolutely beautiful. So we found a lot of Russellas, and, uh, but this is one of the prettiest ones we've seen. It's a beautiful, beautiful lavender color with a little bit of kind of like a lighter tan in the center. It's, it's like pristine and perfect little Russella. Some of the characteristics that often are helpful in identifying Russellas are the uh, forking on the gills. Some gills fork quite a bit, other ones don't fork at all. 
this one seems to be non-forking, which will help to help to identify it because it's kind of unusual when the gills don't fork. But there might be there's a little forking at the margin, but not much. What do you think? I don't know. But it's it's uh, it's very hard to identify rustlers because a lot of the books only talk about a few out of the hundreds that are out there, and the colors have huge variance even on the same variety. Um, but this is a really, really pretty rustler. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example of how brittle the stem is because you squeeze it a little bit, it just crumbles like chalk. Um, and this is extremely unusual to find a rustler in hot weather that's this clean of insects. You know, it's really fresh and clean. It must have just come out. But it's big. It's a large size rustler too. Beautiful. Here's another great example of a Haria chromapes, the yellow foot bolete. And if you notice on the stem, it's easy to see it here, these little tiny dots or hairs on the earth that are, and they're more prevalent down here. They're reddish in color. And they're called punctae. Punctae is the uh, technical term for them. And uh, this is just a really nice, fresh one. That's just how they should look when they're in perfect condition. And you see the, the cap is a tan kind of pink definitely has pink tones to it and the pores are very white and they're they're non-bruising they don't turn blue when you run your finger across them here's another tiny little guild bully that was next to it Another Amanita to take a look at over here. One of the one of the most common ones you'll see in Massachusetts for Amanitas is Amanita flaviconia. It's really a pretty Amanita. It's got beautiful color. It could be more orange or this kind of yellow. The stem has yellow tones to it too, but underneath the gills are white. And that's how you would differentiate this from the Jacksonii who has the orange gills. Plus this is, or yellow gills, this is a much smaller stature to the mushroom. You know, the, the uh, Jacksonii were bigger than my knife and this is, this is literally like half the size of the knife. So it's a much smaller mushroom and you often see them even smaller in size. This is a kind of a large one. But Another characteristic on this one is that the universal veil is yellow. So it yeah, yellow yep, you patches. see it on the ring, yellow patches on top. Right, and, and that's the, the common name, right? Yellow, yep. yellow patches. Or sometimes it's called the sunrise amanita. Oh, I never heard that one. That's a good name. Yep. We're heading up the mountainside here and we find another little patch of chanterelles. Differing ages, can't tell exactly what kind of condition they're in, but they're big and beautiful. These are nice large size ones. Yeah, they could have a few worm tunnels in there. This is a nice big cluster of them. And uh, this is chanterelle we've been seeing up here in New Hampshire. The, the foals of the mushroom itself are a little bit pinkish almost. But the interesting thing you'll notice on chanterelles is if you can see it, there's cross veins that go between these foals. So it's very distinctive on golden chanterelles is to have these cross veins that kind of help you identify them. Wow, these are monsters. They're clean. Oh, this is a nice fat one. Look at that. Nice looking chanterelle. Here's a little young one. And if you know what you're collecting and you're collecting it for the table, it's okay to get rid of the stem because you don't want to get all that, get the base of all the dirt in there. Because once you get the dirt into your mushroom, it's hard to get it out. And it's a beautiful kind of fruity fa fragrance. Can you smell that? <laughs> all right, this is another one we we're hoping to run across that um, is closely related to the chanterelles and the black trumpets. This is Craterellus tubiformis, and it often grows trail side and often in little bits of wood like this, but it has kind of a brown cap, almost pinkish gills, 
and a yellow stem. There's a few similar chanterelle family type of things like this. And this one has generally a hollow stem. So if you look, you can see it's hollow right into the stem. And sometimes, sometimes it is open right from the top, right through like a vase. But this is, a, this is another good edible, but it does shrink down when you cook it. So it's not nearly as prized as the regular chanterelles. So here's a cluster of another type of squealis that's probably one of the most common one. It has a really long period. It comes out sometimes May all the way till November. And uh, it has kind of a tacky or sticky cap, which is called viscid, a viscid cap, um, like colored pores. And if you can see on the stem, there's tiny red dots all along the stem. And this is very characteristic of this variety. Here's an older one. You can see them there too, really clearly. And it doesn't bruise a different color when you when you cut it or, pre or press on it. And uh, it's very sticky. I have it all over my fingers now. And some people have kind of an allergy to the stuff that's on here. People do eat these. I think they're really mediocre tasting. And people who do eat them tend to peel the skin off the cap, um, peel that all off, and then cook them thoroughly. And they still taste lousy to me. But some people really like these. And... They're very easy to find. There's just lots of them around the woods. So it's Suelis granulatus. A common mushroom in New England you find year round is the turkey tail, which is a small polypore. And it's kind of like this banded pattern and it's a white, tiny, tiny pores underneath. And uh, we just stopped here because this log is just beautiful. It's got a cluster growing on them. Turkey tails are not something you'd be eating, but they're used as a medicinal tincture. A lot of uh, people that are into holistic medicine really prize turkey tails as a great one to use. One of the most prized edible mushrooms that people really get excited about are the black trumpets. Uh, Craterellus phallus, probably this one. Um, when you look at this hillside, at first blush, you probably don't see any mushrooms. And you really have to develop an eye for spotting black trumpets. Um, but there's actually a bunch of them here and down the hillside behind us there's even more. Um, here's one. And you can see typically the black trumpets, they have kind of a gray outside. There's that, um, they're virtually paper thin and hollow inside. Um, but often if you find one, you find lots. And they have an incredibly nice fragrance and just beautiful flavor. They're great with fish and seafood and just, they're a wonderful mushroom. Here's some. Sometimes you can get just thousands of these if they're really actively sprouting, but they're very easy to just walk right by and not even notice. And these, when you bring them home, you can, you can dry them. They dry and reconstitute really well, or you can just wash them off and saute them. When you wash them, you generally rip them right in half so you can get out any dirt that might collect on the inside of the mushroom. Um, and the more you look, the more you find. There's always like, here's a little cluster of three or four more. There's, yeah, there's a big one. But I mean, we've hit points where you can just pick for hours and there's just so many. Um, they tend to just grow like crazy.